Okay, well, good morning, everybody. This is John Carroll. I am the Editor-in-Chief of Endpoints News. I'm here with John Chinsky, the CEO of Catalan, the multinational CDMO, who's been very active this morning, as well as all of last year. Uh, we're we're going to take a look at what's coming up in 2021, but you can't look at 2021 without taking a minute to look back at 2020, the most momentous, eventful, consequential year of the biopharma industry. John, it's been an extraordinary past year. I think everybody could agree with that, no matter what. Uh, huge IPOs, a lot of different deal-making things going on, a lot of different events, a whole new chapter and vaccines being opened up with messenger RNA and historic advance. Big deal. Uh, big deal. So I, I'm kind of curious. I mean, if you go back to look at 2020, I mean, what are the things that stand out for you in terms of how this was a big year? You know, um, I, I had to start off with a bit of a funny comment, which is, first of all, we actually learned exactly how resilient we all personally were, because I can tell you, as I sat at my living room table in week five of COVID, I was saying to my wife, I don't know how I can do this another week, right? And here we are 10 months later. So, you know, the amazing thing is, is just how we all picked ourselves up, figured out a new way uh, to do things and kind of moved on. And it wasn't just moving on. We had to move on and do big things. I mean, really big things, right? I mean, uh, you know, from a catalog perspective, you know, the phone was ringing off the hook. Uh, from everybody who thought they had either a therapy or was going to get in line with the overall vaccine. And uh, it, was, it was really crazy times. But if, if I take a look back at, at, at uh, 2020, and obviously I've got a specific view as it, uh, as it pertains to CDMOs, right? And I'll say the first off is, is one of the big factors or one of the big things that I want to talk about is the fact that, you know, CDMOs were critical in the ability of our industry to respond to an unprecedented challenge. Now, what do I mean by that? The vertically integrated pharmaceutical uh, industry of, of 20 years ago would be challenged to mobilize the capacity and the capability at the scale and speed that was required to respond to the pandemic, right? And you know, at Catalan alone, we repurposed and built in a few months uh, fill finished capacity, uh, equaling about 250 million vials, which can supply about a billion and a half doses. I mean, last week we just had a line uh, come on uh, in our Bloomington facility that was slated to come online at the end of 2021. We literally pulled it in by nearly a year and it's gonna play a critical role in the pandemic. So I think, again, I'm looking at a narrow view which was, uh, you know, from our industry standpoint, um, and it's going to be enduring because I can tell you the, the larger pharma companies, small and mid-sized companies have always looked at a company like Catalan to do their work, but now the big companies are doing it. You know, the other thing is, uh, I, there's a great note that came out from Jeffries uh, Windley, and it was about eight, the $88 billion of money raised uh, for, for biotech, biotech funding. Yeah. I mean, it is just awesome. absolutely astounding. And, you know, I, I had the report here and I was, I was just looking at the graphs and I don't know if you saw this report, John, but when you take a look at, I don't know, it's not going to come up there, but when you take a look at the graph, it is just absolutely nuts. I mean, we're in the fourth quarter of 20, nearly $23 billion raised. Now that's, you know, not just, you know, IPOs, it's through IPOs, pipes, venture capital raises and so forth. And whether or not we're gonna have another year like that, I don't know, but I've been doing this for 11 years and I've seen, you know, troughs and, and, and peaks, but this, this was just unbelievable. So, I mean, those are kind of two big things. Okay, so this is about looking forward to 2021. And from your perspective, running a, a multinational CDMO, supply chain's been a big issue as it relates to the vaccine. So what's your projection for what's going to happen with the supply chain over the next six months? Well, so first of all, let me tell you that the supply chain disruptions that we thought we'd have were relatively muted in 2020. And as I go forward in 2021, look, 
the life sciences, uh, the, the suppliers into the life sciences space, into all these biologics, um, CDMOs, that's where we've had, I would say, the biggest pinch points because everybody's clamoring for the same materials. And by and large, I would say through the last quarter, a lot of that has been, uh, has been, has been worked out. Um, the key is, is just keeping the factories up and running. And we've really learned, really learned how to do that. So I think, you know, from an overall supply chain standpoint, um, you're going to, you know, see materials continue to flow. I think the pharmaceutical industry probably has one of the mo most robust supply chains, but because you can't have patients without, right? You can't have patients without. But, um, you know, there, there will continue to be certain pinch points. And certainly, uh, you know, when you have rated orders on you, as Catalan does from the, from the government, that can also create pinch points uh, with regards to your existing customers. And you kind of have to work through that. So, you know, I wouldn't say that I, I see anything other than the, the industry continuing to strengthen. And certainly everything we learned in early days of COVID from a supply chain standpoint are in place and going to work all the way through 2021. So you think largely the supply chain issues will be resolved fairly soon? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, there. I, I've probably been on more supply chain calls uh, last year than in my entire career, right? Um, but uh, we were able to work through all of those, and I can tell you that we haven't had any substantial misses due to the overall supply chain. Now, there's going to be a a, a, a push. OK, for people to continue to say we need, you know, these are now critical assets that we need to have in North America, Western Europe. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, what are people willing to pay for? And I think there's still going to be a lot of supply chain that's going to continue to come from India, uh, China, Asia. I, I think things are going to continue to even out. And unfortunately, in the U.S., I can't say about the rest of the world, we have pretty short memories. And as soon as one problem gets fixed, we kind of move on. And, you know, I only hope there, there are, there's some lessons learned. There certainly are in Catalan where we need to have real enterprise risk management. We, we need to make sure we really understand where our, our stuff's coming from a supply chain standpoint. But I, I think you're going to see a lot more normalcy happening from a supply chain standpoint throughout 2021. Okay. Well, I thought for the purposes of this conversation, it would be valuable to come up with a top 10 list of my projections for what's going to happen in 2021. And let's pop up that list. Here we go. Okay, here are top 10, my, my, these are my top 10 predictions. And I'd like to go through these on a kind of one by one basis with you, John, and take a look at this in the context of what's happening in the industry and, and why I came up with these particular, uh, these particular points. My point number one, an mRNA company is bought out. And the reason why I say that is that this past year, we've seen messenger RNA vaccines become the, the critical new technology in vaccines, particularly as it relates to pandemics. I think we're going to be talking about pandemics for a long time to come. And I think for the traditional larger players in this field, operate without actually owning uh, one of these companies and I'm not saying which one because these some of these a couple of these companies are really really cool <laughs> you need a you need about 75 to 100 billion dollars right yeah you, you need a, you need a lot of money to buy some of these companies and that may put them beyond the range and besides they really want to become fully integrated companies in any case but there are a number of different mRNA companies out there for purchase and uh, my prediction is that <clears throat> at least one of those is going to get bought out, if not more than one. I certainly, I certainly wouldn't bet against that one, John. And uh, I'll tell you, I mean, what, so what's we, we basically went over a watershed moment. Two products approved on an MR, mRNA uh, platform, right? And, and what has happened through that? So first of all, we know that, you know, this has been going, we've, we've been doing work here for the last 10, 15, maybe even 20 years. But now a lot of work's been done. There's a lot of papers out there. We have two approved products. And oh, by the way, it's going through the regulatory process, right? Both for the emergency use, as well as for full approval that hopefully will be coming in April or May. There's a lot of learning here. And what we do know, what we do know is small, mid-sized biotech is what fuels big pharma. And they buy a lot of their innovation. 
So I, I think um, people are going to be looking at mRNA in this therapeutic category in a significant way. And yeah, it, I'm, I'm sure there's a price tag in almost all of those companies. I think that's a pretty darn good uh, prediction. We'll see. Okay. So second one, several new variants complicate the COVID-19 vaccine campaigns. This is one that I consider virtually a kind of a gimme. Um, it's almost, it's certain to happen because that's what viruses do. They mutate, they change. Uh, they were, uh, you see, you've seen this in the UK. Um, it's become uh, more virulent in the sense that it spreads faster, even though it's evidently not, uh, doesn't have a greater impact on the people that it uh, infects. Um, but I think that this is going to be a kind of a key theme now for, for a long time to come because it's going to emphasize the fact that the world needs to come up with a regular camp ability to respond to any new pandemic virus that comes up and the repeat emergence of new variants is gonna to continue to raise this issue over and over and over again. Are we prepared? Can we move swiftly? Do we have an infrastructure for this for the next time around? And I think that the variants are gonna play a very important role as it relates to highlighting the importance of that and really changing the way vaccines are developed and the way that they're produced and manufactured and distributed around the world. So let me, let me make a couple of comments and one will seem a little bit offbeat, but probably on point. You know, one of the biggest issues with the variants is just the uncertainty and, and potential misinformation. I mean, one of the challenges that we have with the pandemic and the vaccines is with all of the information out there, truthful, untruthful. Uh, you know, my mother called me and said, John, should I take the vaccine? Actually, she said, Johnny, should I take the vaccine? She's 83, 84. I said, mom, absolutely. They're safe. They're effective you know, and, and so forth. But, you know, people hear so much that I think the first problem with the variant is it's just another reason not to quote unquote trust the vaccine. And that's really an unfortunate. Um, I was actually uh, uh, part participated in, a, in, a, uh, in, in one of these conferences where Gottlieb was speaking last week and he did a great job talking about how uh, they really did a pretty good job. They had, uh, you know, one of the companies had, you know, went after four different, uh, a pro, a vari uh, not variants, but four different spots. And one was the full spike protein because they knew that there would be some, uh, you know, some variation and mutation that would happen. And so I think even with what we know now, uh, retrospectively, they did a good job of actually picking it up. And I think, the, the latest information that we have is, is we think we're going to be okay and that we will go after it. But I think uh, we are learning a lot about uh, what do we go after when we do something like an mRNA or we do these vaccines so that they're durable after, uh, after there is an overall mutation. But I'll, I'll come back to my first point. I think the, the biggest challenge is just, you know, we want to have trust in these in these vaccines. And I think the variant is just one other reason for, you know, the Twitter, Twitter sphere and everything else to go crazy and, and, and lose trust. Yeah, one would like to live in a world without misinformation, but that's definitely not going to happen in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> so the third one is Novartis spends more than $5 billion on a bolt-on acquisition. And I'm singling out Novartis for a reason. One is that they like bolt-ons, of course, all the majors really like bolt-ons in one fashion or another. Uh, I think they're due. I think they're due for something substantial. I don't think that they're going to do anything kind of over the top in the tens of billions of dollars. Um, and that's why I picked that sum of money. And that's why I picked that pharma company. But I would say in a more general sense, bolt-ons ruled in 2020. Bolt-ons continue to rule in 2021. I don't see any fundamental change in the way pharma continues to acquire innovation, acquire new technologies and get into the game. Um, I think that that's, is, and that's what this is really intended to get across. The significance of bolt-on acquisitions continuing to be the major theme on the M&A side of the industry. Yeah, so first of all, Novartis, great company. I don't have any specific insights other than that's what they're saying in their capital alloc allocation is that they're gonna to continue to do a normal amount of M&A bolt-ons. And I, I think, you know, whether it's Catalan, Novartis, you know, you have a strategy, you know where your gaps are, 
you know whether you want to fill out both capability and capacity and you go you go do that and again you know i think they've they've got a pretty good track record they're going to continue to continue to do that and, and uh, it'll be fun to watch yeah i think vaz nara simon the, the ceo in particular enjoys the, the the nimbleness associated with what he's trying to do at a, at a major huge multinational corporation and this is one way that one way that they can do that uh number four is the ipo market cools down um and this fits within my uh <laughs> Kind of, kind of a, a theme of uh, you cannot defy the laws of physics. I mean, eventually, uh, you know, what was super hot has to cool down. We saw in 2020 uh, an extraordinary market in any every sort of respect. Um, companies that started off looking at and, and kind of conversational purposes, looking at $100 million, ending up with $250 million plus. Um, and you've seen uh, uh, this happen over and over and over and over again. So while I continue to think that the IPO market will be remain open, the window will remain open, and as, as it has been for several years, I don't think we can see a repeat of 2020 again. If for no other reason than the economy opens back up for other things once this pandemic starts to really wind down. So, you know, this is, uh, I don't know if you know a guy called Byron Weens who, who uh, is with Blackstone and he usually, usually comes out with, uh, you know, his top 10 surprises for the year, you know, things that people didn't want to think. And I, I think that would be a surprise because I think there's so much momentum behind it that I, I don't know what slows down the IPO. And I think there's also been a little bit of a fundamental shift because the valuations are so high the best way for them to get their money is through an IPO versus, you know, because the quote unquote smarter money is not willing to pay up for those valuations. So if the valuations get knocked down, I think you'll see the I IPO market come down a little bit, but otherwise, you know, I, we'll, we'll see what happens here in the, in the, in the first quarter. Yeah. We've already been surprised in the first week. So I, yeah. I can't imagine what's going to happen throughout the first quarter. I will say this about the IPO market. A lot of what's driving the IPOs right now is based on the conversation that companies are styling themselves as the next Regeneron, as the next big play in biotech. And that's fine because Moderna did that, right? I mean, right. they became the next Regeneron last year. Um, and I think that uh, there are just so many next Regenerons in the world and they're going to be, there's going to be a little bit more selectivity, perhaps, in terms of how the market chooses which one that is, and a little bit less of the, you know, let's bet on every cow in the corral. Um, so that, that, that should be, it's going to be fascinating to watch one way or the other. We're going to play this one out at endpoints. We're going to look at each one as they, as they play out. And there are going to be a lot of IPOs coming up. So number five, Big Pharma goes deeper into gene therapies as new data underscores that this is no easy field. We saw a lot of significant setbacks, uh, particularly in Q4 as it relates to gene therapies. Um, I think, at, and this is happening as Big Pharma's begun to acquire more of these operations, begin to go deeper into gene therapies. You've seen it at Pfizer and so on, but it's not gonna be, a, it's not gonna be easy. It's going, you're going to see more setbacks with the proliferation of more programs, and people are going to have to sort out you know, what's working and what's not working. Not to say that it's going to stop, because gene therapy has got huge momentum too, but it is going to be an eventful year in a lot of different respects. Eventful on the side of seeing impressive new data, and eventful on the side of seeing some more setbacks as well as people begin to sort this thing out on a more one-on-one -on -one basis as opposed to looking at the whole field in the same way. So I'll tell you that um, one of the best conversations I've had in the last several weeks was with Bob Smith at Pfizer. And, uh, you know, I've, you know, we've been watching Pfizer, obviously we've, you know, have Paragon gene therapy. Uh, Pfizer's pretty much vertically integrating, right? They went out, they bought assets, um, and they have quietly built maybe one of the best gene therapy pipelines out there. And I won't uh, uh, state because I don't know what their public uh, statements are versus what, it, what Bob and I discussed about, but they have significant plans for putting in new, new gene therapy programs per year. Again, not knowing what's public and not public, I won't, I won't state the numbers. 
but it's very, very impressive. Um, they started with literally nothing six to seven years ago. And I think they're going to be a powerhouse from a gene therapy standpoint, from my perspective. And I agree with you that, you know, look, I'm an electrical engineer. I got to start off with that. I'm not a biologist. Um, but I approach everything from a science, uh, let's not put scientific, from an engineering perspective, you know, like deterministic. And a lot of what we see is good science combined with cartoons, right, to show how something happens. And everybody says, this is how it's going to happen. Well, the body's not that simple. It's super complex. And, um, you know, a lot of our best therapies we've stumbled upon because we didn't know how the body worked. And we found out later on, well, hey, maybe this is good for that. So I think in gene therapy, you take that to a whole new level. I mean, um, the, 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 the case is firm. I, we, we know that we can uh, do uh, you know, gene editing and gene therapy, but we don't yet understand exactly what the dur durability of that is going to be. I think there's some, some you know, really you know, big problems that are going to continue to be solved. And I agree that those resources a lot are going to come from from big pharma getting in the game and helping to solve some of those problems, notwithstanding the awesome work being done by you know the the younger and smaller gene therapy companies. But but again, I uh, you know Pfizer, I, it's really amazing what I what I heard from Bob and and what they're doing. And uh, if you're listening, Bob, we'd love to partner with you on manufacturing capacity <laughs> at some point should you need it. So, so, John, you're telling me right now that the first half of number five has already happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been seven years. I mean, it didn't happen last week when I talked to Bob. They've been building it quietly for a long time. So, and you, you probably heard that they're already going into, actually, it was your article on endpoints of uh, Pfizer and their phase three for DMD. So, um, you know, that's, uh, they're, there, they're there and they're going to keep plugging along. Pfizer, another great company. Absolutely. Okay, number six, China deals are back in vogue as relations normalize. It's been a fractious relationship over a couple of years' time. There have been a lot of charges back and forth, a lot of uncertainty between governments. My projection is that things start to normalize under the new administration, and that uh, begins to enhance the kind of trans-Pacific nature of a lot of what's going on in biopharma today. A lot more deals, a lot more opportunity for companies to work together on both sides of the Pacific. Your take. So uh, I'll go back to my short memories comment. You know, we'll have a new administration. We've got short memories. And if you take a look at um, innovation uh, in the biotech world, um, it, number two is China. Uh, and they, they have the potential, you know, to surpass us at some point. So I think, you know, you've got innovation there. Uh, you've got real um, capability You've got, uh, you know, a strong industry and, and back to, you know, does the U.S. really want to make vitamin C? It's not going to happen, right? It's going to, China's still going to make all the vitamin C for the world. So uh, I, I do think there will be a normalization uh, that will happen faster than we thought it would have. But hopefully there's also some lessons learned so that there can be, you know, a better exchange uh, between between countries and so forth. So we'll see what happens in the new new administration. But we can see even 10, 11 months after COVID, we're you know we haven't picked up and started plants in the U.S. There's been a couple of announcements, but you know that's not that's not going to happen. So I I think that's you and you and I agree on that one. Okay. Uh, number seven, there'll be at least one big pharma merger, a la Alexion and Allergan. And the reason I, I picked those is because they're, they're very much of a, of a type. Um, the companies allow the acquirer to kind of reliably add on to the revenue that they have projected for a year. They have big franchises that are well-established, well in place, not necessarily so much R&D oriented, so much as that they're finance oriented. And I think that that's the kind of thing that a lot of big pharma companies are very comfortable with. And I think that what you've seen in both instances is that analysts can get very comfortable with that as well. So what you're not going to want to see are, are a lot of big pharma companies doing 40, $39 billion deals like Alexion so that they can get into a very speculative sort of a situation where people are gonna wonder whether or not some of the new drugs that are in the pipelines that are being acquired are gonna really come through or not. I think that they're gonna come through with a lot of de-risking associated with it. 
And as a result, they won't be as exciting as you would normally expect when you see a $40 billion deal come down the pike. Look, um, Allergan is the perfect acquisition for almost every big pharma company. Botox, right? Yeah. Botox and synergies. That's what you get. You get Botox and synergies. And, you know, uh, what better company to buy than AbbVie, who's got a single product, basically franchise, right? So you put AbbVie and Allergan together and, you know, all of a sudden you've got the juice of the single product and then you've got the stability of the, of, of Botox. So, um, you know, if there were more Allergans out there, I think they would certainly uh, be, be acquired. But I, I do think that, you know, Big Pharma is never satisfied with its footprint. Yeah. yeah. You know, and they're always looking to, you know, off board or on board, right? Well, I'm getting rid of consumer health. I'm going to get in an infectious pipeline. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, I don't know exactly how those strategy sessions happen, but, you know, it usually starts with, well, the pipeline that we thought we'd be there in seven years uh, we're now two years out from that seven years and it's not materialized. So we have to do something. So it usually ends up when they're at the end of, you know, their pipeline and they're staring into nothingness and they say, look, we got to do something. So there's constant reconfiguration that will happen. It makes it a dynamic, exciting space. And, uh, you know, um, Catalan seems to get bigger every time one of these deals happens because uh, a bigger company, a pharma company buys a small company and that's more revenues for us when it stays with Catalan, so. Right, okay. Number eight, drug pricing debate shifts back to Medicare policy, reimportation finally dies. I've been waiting for the reimportation debate to end for years now because it's never gonna happen. The industry could shut it off and already has actually probably shut it off before it could even begin. Nobody's gonna reimport drugs in substantial quantities from Canada because Canada won't allow it. They, won't, they don't wanna become a proxy for the United States. Yet it con con continues to come up as a policy debate year after year after year after year. And I think that eventually it's just gonna have to die. And maybe this is more hope than actual <laughs> expectation. I mean, this was the wrong idea. I do think though that there's gonna be a lot of focus on Medicare policy in terms of whether or not they can negotiate prices and so on. There'll be, a, I think, a shift back to attempt to work out a real world type of drug pricing reform that could work on both sides of the aisle. It's going to have to be bipartisan no matter what happens. So first of all, you know, bad ideas ultimately die. And so that's... I wonder about Washington, D.C. though. <laughs> well, I, I would just tell you, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's not just, you know, just import from Canada, you know, for the, for the simple mind, it sounds simple, but it's, it's much more complicated than that. But um, I would tell you that um, the Trump administration's um, attempt with uh, most favored nation. Um, so of course, um, like uh, unfortunately a few things Trump, um, you know, idea might've been in the right realm but the implementation was wrong. I, I think that one's gonna, you know, it's failed in the courts but I think they may uh, see if uh, there's, there's some uh, fruit there because I have to tell you, Having you know worked in Europe and, and dealt with European sales forces and MFN there, they figured it out and it works. The only problem is, is if we truly do that here, then who's going to subsidize drug development for the rest of the world? Yep. Okay. So I'm going to wrap up the next two in one because we're, we're getting close to our time here. Traveling to the one hour meeting is dead. The red eye is dead. Travel remains limited well past the pandemic. We're going to relook at the way we handle our travel arrangements, do the important things, and wipe away the old things. We're going to stick on Zoom for a lot of the things that just take an hour to accomplish. And we will make plans to fly to San Francisco for JP Morgan 2022. Jamie Diamond, if you're listening, I don't want to fly to San Francisco. I love your Zoom format. It's highly productive, highly effective. And my wife made me bacon, eggs, and a piece of toast so I could endure the day. Please keep it on Zoom. All right. Yes. Well, I, I don't. I don't know that that's going to happen. I, I do think that nah, it won't happen. I'm just putting in my vote. Yeah, that would that would be an interest. That would really be a radically new kind of a world in terms of how we're shaping up on that side. Because I think that 
we've all learned just how productive you can be on Zoom. Um, I think that the one of the, the key secondary lessons in this whole process has been, okay, how do we limit the amount of time that we're working anymore? Because it does just stay open and it just goes on and on. So I think that there's a lot of lessons to learn here, but one of them definitely is we're gonna rework the whole way everyone works together. You're gonna to balance out Zoom with the face-to-face. -face. The face-to-face -face is gonna happen where it's important. John, that's all the time we got today. I really appreciate you taking the time here. You're wearing your lucky boots and that to everybody. Let me see if I can get those up here. Yeah, I got my boots on for you. That to everybody means that all of this is much more likely to happen. <laughs> so <laughs> keep you posted as to how these predictions work for the course of 2021. And uh, I'll include John's uh, predictions here as well related to the supply chain. I appreciate it very much. Thanks to the audience for turning out. We're gonna be back in just a few minutes with another important panel on drug pricing. So thank you very much. And we'll be back. Good in be Thanks, John.